I made the mistake of going out on the internet once and going like, hey, I don't see why Spider-Man No Way Home couldn't have been one of the 10 movies nominated for Best Picture. Not even like should win, just I don't see why. We got 10 nominations and I got dragged for a day on social media where people were like, you should have died in that heart attack. <laughs> Can you imagine? Hey GQ, it's me, Kevin Smith, and today we're gonna talk about comic book movies and the comic book characters I love. When you say to me, who is Spider-Man? I don't know that anybody leaps to mind. My take on the original Spider-Man movies, I thought Tobey Maguire did a really good Peter Parker, but he wasn't quippy enough as Spider-Man. And I thought Andrew Garfield was an excellent Spider-Man, but his Peter Parker was, dare I say it, too sexy. Anyone would date Andrew Garfield. You know, Peter Parker, that's, that's a problem in his life. Nobody really wants to date him and stuff. So I think Tom Holland, for me, has encapsulated Peter Parker and Spider-Man in the way that I prefer to see him portrayed. He looks the age, looks age appropriate, like Toby always looked older to me. And he's soft. Peter Parker is like a little soy boy. He's soft, right? Super smart, but he's like totally soft. Soft enough that the death of Uncle Ben changes the course of his existence where he's like, I'm gonna dedicate my life to fighting crime. I'm poor, but I'm smart and I know how to build web shooters and stuff. I could develop these things. But like, I let a guy go and that guy killed my uncle. Never again. Hands down, I feel the best Spider-Man movie ever made is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Absolutely captures everything about both Peter Parker and Miles Morales, who came years later. My favorite moment in that movie, though, belongs to Chris Pine, who plays the iteration of Spider-Man, who, spoilers, dies in the beginning. He has this moment where he's very, you know, pithy and blithe and uh, crack and wise while he's fighting this gigantic version of the Green Goblin. But then when he's finally felled, he's tired and he's broken and you can tell he's on the ropes and he's just like, okay, I'll, I just need a second. I always get up, I always get up. And he's talking to Miles Morales and he says, we gotta team up. He's like, you gotta take this thing, you gotta stick it in that thing, blah, blah, blah. And then he, say, he gets so serious. I'm, I might cry like talking about it. He gets so serious where he goes, listen, you wear a mask. You don't let him know who you are. He's got the you need to hide your face. You don't tell anyone who you are. No one can know. He's got everyone in his pocket. What? If he turns the machine on again, everything you know will disappear. Your family, everyone. And it's so, like, there's a moment, it's just 10 seconds that puts the gravity of the situation. We just watched this motherfucker fight a giant oversized beast as like, you know, a trans portal interdimensional device is going on and shit like that. There's threats everywhere. But that 10 seconds where he warns the kid to hide his face, which makes mask wearing make sense. This moment in Spider-Man captures perfectly the threat at the center of every superhero's life, which is like, I'm gonna do the right thing. And in doing so, I'm gonna put everyone I know at risk if they know who I am. I thought that moment was profound. Sometimes I just roll that, smoke weed, watch that moment and just go, yes, fucking yes. Like they stuck the landing on that very moment. The rest of the movie could have sucked and that moment would have redeemed it all. But the whole movie is fantastic. You wanna talk about people who understand Spider-Man and the Spider-Man mythos? Ugh. Watching Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse is an exercise in fan appreciation and abject jealousy, because I'll never write something as beautiful as that. It's a story that everyone could get behind, right? Because who are they? They're outsiders. And everybody in this world, I don't care if you're the ultimate insider, sooner or later you feel like an outsider. Sooner or later you feel castigated by society. Sooner or later you feel like the other. And this is a story that encapsulates that. This is a story about a bunch of others who have these secret powers and the world don't want them around. We don't want your kind of dirty mutants and stuff. You know, it's a very, it's an allegorical title to say the least, but it also has Wolverine, which is just badass character. A guy that, you know, snicked and the claws come out and he slices and dices you. Look, this is why I love comic books, plain and simple. They are simple parables about the worst thing in the world ever happening. And everybody is running from it like crazy, as they should, responsibly. And then there's one person or a small team dressed very colorfully heading straight 
toward it. Like, I'll read that story from now until the end of time, man. And the X-Men encapsulate that. Even though society doesn't respect them, they reject them completely. Charles Xavier and his X-Men still go out and protect humanity from the worst threats. Sometimes mutants, sometimes not mutants. There are mutants out there with incredible powers, Logan. And many who do not share my respect for mankind. If no one is equipped to oppose them, humanity's days could be over. So they dominated the 90s and the aughts in the comic book marketplace. And they're set to dominate the comic book marketplace again now that Kevin Feige and Marvel Studios have their hands on the X-Men characters and all the X-Men IP that Fox used to have by themselves. They made some wonderful movies over Fox about the X-Men. But now we're going to see them brought into the Marvel Studios, man, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So the X-Men are going to be side by side with Spider-Man with Thor, with Iron Man. This is a great day for those of us who love to keep our universes together. I can't wait for the day that DC and Marvel fight each other, and it will happen one day. Chris Claremont, who is a brilliant writer and created most of what we know and love about the X-Men, was writing an epic that you couldn't just jump into. It was one of the few comic books that you couldn't just pick up and be like, oh, I know the story now. It was so involved, so fraught, so big. Well, of course, we all love Wolverine. It's a very cool idea. And he's Canadian. That makes me love him even more. I'm not Canadian. I'm just a big fan of Canada, big Canada file and stuff. But I'm a big uh, Cyclops guy, to be honest with you. The idea of the ruby quartz visor always captured my imagination. This guy has to wear these glasses for the rest of his life. If he takes them off, he has no control out of these lasers that shoot out of his head. He can't even look into the eyes of Jean Grey, the woman he loves, without possibly killing her. And there's a really beautiful moment in one of the X-Men movies, I forget which one it is, where he takes off his glasses for one second and she sees his eyes. And it's like, oh, it's incredibly moving. Scott Summers, man, he's also, he's the Dante of the X-Men universe, like Dante from Quick Stop and Clerks. Just put upon, has to carry everything. He's not even supposed to be there that day and stuff. And you're competing with Wolverine for the affection of your girlfriend. Good night, Logan. You know, not that Gene shows much interest in Wolverine beyond a friend, but you constantly got the threat of Wolverine at your back, not as an enemy who's gonna cut you up, but as somebody who's like, you know, I'm stealing your girl. You gonna tell me to stay away from your girl? Well, if I had to do that, she wouldn't be my girl. Hmm. Well, then I guess you've got nothing to worry about, do you, Cyclops? The Incredible Hulk to me will always be Lou Ferrigno. Because I grew up watching Lou Ferrigno on TV. You have to realize how special it was to have a comic book TV show. You know, nowadays, turn on Disney Plus and they start a new one almost every week. Back then, we didn't have a lot of choices. And there was a character on a TV show called The Incredible Hulk who looked like the Incredible Hulk. You know, they changed Bruce Banner's name, Dr. David Bruce Banner. They made him David because I guess they felt Bruce sounded too soft for the 70s. So they altered his name, but everything about, else about him was accurate. So Lou Ferrigno is a guy just painted green. And he's there. You know, don't get me wrong, all the visual effects they do with the current day Hulk is amazing. But he's tactile. He's a guy crashing through a wall with green paint on him. You could see him and stuff. And, you know, in our childhood, that was enough. We were never like, the Hulk should be bigger. Like, we were like, oh my God, look at the Hulk, he's amazing. So, yeah, Lou Ferrigno will always be my Hulk. That being said, like, I think Ruffalo's doing a bang up job. He's the best uh, Bruce Banner for my money. That's my secret, Captain. I'm always angry. Poor Eric Bannon, man. Like, every movie he's in, it looks like this is gonna be huge, and then it like, boom, 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 doesn't quite connect. He's such a wonderful actor. He was good, really good, but for me, Ruffalo's really doing it. And Ed Norton, I thought, was really good, too and brought some cool ideas to the character. But Ruffalo has the kind of requisite sweetness as well. You know, at the center of Bruce Banner's character, in the comics at least, is somebody who's trying to do the right thing. I put the brains and the brawn together, and now look at me. 
best of both worlds. You know, in the comic books, there's a gamma bomb test that they're doing. And Rick Jones, you know, kid, is out in the testing field, and Bruce Banner goes to save his life and push him, like, into a trench to save him from the blast, and that's how he gets hit with the gamma bomb, and that's what turns him into the Hulk. So he's got a compassionate heart at his center, and, and we all know that Mark Ruffalo seems to be a pretty compassionate guy as well. Thank you for having me, GQ. Uh, <clears throat> to the fine folks at GQ, thanks for having me. Those were my fine points.